Anna, if you'd be so kind. Hi, good morning. Oh, well, I would say good afternoon, perhaps, is more correct. Uh, we're presenting this series called Rafaelismo in the movie Star Gala, and we've got to present it. We've got the protagonist, Rafael. We have the co-directors, Charlie Arnaiz and Alberto Ortega, and we also have got the producer, Jose Ramon del Rio, Marijo Larrañaga. Sorry, Jose Ramon del Rio is from the record company producers, Marijo Larrañaga and Juan Andres Garcia. I imagine you've got many, you're looking forward to ask questions, so please raise your hand and I'll give you um, the microphone. Eh, hola. Hi, Susana. Para el cine puede esperar. Alberto and Charlie, was, how was the idea of making this documentary or this, or was it difficult to uh, involve the artist? And for you, the artist, Rafael, what does it mean for you to premiere this episode here in San Sebastian in, uh, in the festival? Okay, thank you. <coughs> well, for us, we're always seeking uh, to find good stories, and what a better what, what better story than a story about Raphael? Sixty years on stage, uh, it was a real gift for us. The truth is, six decades of him uh, working in the world of entertainment. We made a proposal to Jose Marro de Rio of Universal, and the pieces started to come together because Movie Star was also interested in into making a project with Rafael, and uh, we started to give it shape a bit amongst us all, and as regards to the involvement of Rafael, it was absolute, as you can see, he's here with us today, and I think you can see it in the series, contributing um, archive material, and giving a vision and a profile which has not been seen beforehand, it's unseen footage, for example, and it was the moment to do so, because we're quite fortunately, he's still active, he's still singing on stage. And, um, and I think that the pandemic itself, and to be able to be with him very relaxed at his home, that he wasn't continuously on tour, because if it hadn't have been because of these circumstances, the pandemic, I don't think we'd have been, not have been able to be with him so much time. And something that has emerged, which I think we're all very proud of, all of us that are here today. Well, being here for me is a true honour. It's not the first time. It's the second time I've come to the film festival. I came to present a film by Alex de la Iglesia. Mi gran noche, my great night. And I'd like to go, the truth is I'd love to come every year to the festival. Everyone's got a dream, don't we? Well, that's, that's my dream, so... Sometimes with movie, with a film, other with the documentary, or whatever way, or even singing, who knows? But the, what I'm referring to, the climate, the atmosphere in this city, during this, this period of time, I don't want to miss it anymore. Luisa for Argentina, first of all. In Latin America, I would like to say, you're like the Messi of uh, singers. Me uh, Messi of the singers in Argentina. We love you very much. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm a bit taller and better looking. Well, okay, thank you. You have spent so many, so many years on uh, stage. You've been very avant-garde. How have you adapted to social media of disseminating your music uh, through flat platforms, because the episode that we saw, we journalists beforehand, many of the people are going to enjoy it from their couch at home. How it is it adapted to your social media, streaming? It comes along with, it's with me, it's part of me. I could give you hundreds of excuses, but I think the truth is it, it, it's come along with me. I wouldn't be able to do it any other way. That's the way I am. I'm the, what I do, I'm the most genuine artist in that respect. It comes out on its own, really. 
That's why it's called Raphaelism or Raphaelism. And it couldn't be any other way. Hi, good afternoon. Gabriel Martinez for, for El Periódico. I'm going to ask two questions. One for the director says that we're going to see an unseen Rafael. I would like you to tell us why. And for Rafael, I think that in this second episode that you've, or you're going to project or screen, you reveal some things that perhaps I didn't know about, about of part of his career. For example, the nervous breakdown in Las Vegas, for example. Um, now, for example, after the Olympic Games and everything has had said, well, okay, the pressure that we feel, for example, well, artists or sports people, elite sports people, sometimes is exaggerated, goes over the top. And I would like you to talk about that, whether we're liberating or getting rid of those taboos in order to liberate or release that pressure that the artists are, are under all the time. Hi, everyone. As regards to the um, unseen footage of Rafael, I think we're very proud of that characteristics of this documentary series because to show something which is unseen of an artist that so many things have been said about uh, for so many decades, well, we thought it was a great genuine challenge. And I think we've achieved it for many reasons. One of these is that he has allowed us to hold interviews as if we were having a friendly talk or a chat, five interviews for many hours, where Charlie, who asked the questions, ended up worn out, but Rafael, for him, he would have continued for another five hours. He wasn't tired at all. And at the end, after so many hours, we created a certain um, atmosphere of trust. And there were moments that were very moving. There were anecdotes that emerged that Rafael himself admitted he'd never had told anyone. And then also, we've had access to all of his personal photos, to um, unseen footage at, that we could fa found at, at, at home, thanks to his kids, his children, uh, who allowed us to, we didn't want to miss any photographs that would help us to tell the story about their father. And all of this means that when you see the documentary series, you've got the feeling that you're seeing something which is truly unseen and very moving and exciting. And f for, uh, for the fact that you see a documentary and uh, you... You get goosebumps. I think we can. Uh, we've achieved it, and that's why we're very thankful to Raphael for this. If I understood you correctly, you want me to refer to the uh, the event in Las Vegas. No, I'm saying that. Do you believe that now there are a series of taboos? There's been a taboo as regards to remarking or talking about the pressure under which certain people are under, for example, in the entertainment world, as well as elite sports people, that in the Olympic Games, a girl said, I can't handle this anymore and I'm gonna leave it. Whether it's time now to be able to release and get rid of those taboos, and that's why you've told perhaps that story in the series. No, not exactly like that. I didn't tell it because of that. I've told it because it's something which that did happen, that I never talked about this. I let the version that I was worn out, that I was tired, which is true, I was worn out, but that was the least of the problems. I made a serious mistake. And then, which is, and always trying to be, uh, at the same time, very complacent vis-a-vis -vis my mother. I took her to Las Vegas. And I thought that was going to be marvelous. It turned into uh, a living hell. But 
my poor mother <laughs> is not to blame at all. The fault, it's my fault, because I wanted to turn s something that's abnormal turning into norm something normal. Well, you, a, a man who's working at four shows every day with no time to sleep for almost two months when I was 21. What I wanted to do was to go out and party because I was 21. And my mother was recriminating me all the time. I think it was a serious mistake that I've always thought about perhaps telling it at some time, but I've never... But I never got a chance, uh, like a moment like this, to be able to tell that story. I know my mother, wherever she is, would understand many things, and I'm sure she will forgive me. And she will love me even more for having told the story. And the truth is, I'm very, I feel very relieved now, <laughs> having, having done so. Y que el fam informativos um, uh, Telecinco News. Uh, Rafael, I would like to know whether you consider with this work the audience is going to be able to know more about you. I'm not too sure whether we'll have the chance to get closer to your figure. I read in an interview that you said that you always think about the, what you've got to do in the future. And beyond this work, I would like to know how you address your future. What else have you got to do? My future. Well, it's okay. It's I can't really say that. Well, quite good, but conditioned because we're in a situation. We're in the situation we're in. But uh, well, let's hope that everything will be resolved. And thinking positively, I won't. I'll, I'll, I've still got a few years on stage because I love. It drives me crazy. I love it. And why not? I'll repeat. I'll get involved in a film, and I'll repeat doing things in this format. I love the audience to be able to see in me many, many different facets of me because I have them. Why am I not going to exploit them, for example, or use them in my favor? So therefore, if God uh, believes and the pandemic allows us to do it, there many. I'm going to be doing many new things. I want to take advantage. I'm not too sure that perhaps Marijo and Juan Andres and Jose Ramon would like to talk about the, the process uh, with Rafaelismo and what, what they were involved in. Would you like to say something? Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for the welcome. Thank you to Rafael for opening up the way he has done in this documentary series and to explain and tell us the stories he's told us. The process of Rafaelismo is, in, is included with the movie star plus of telling original stories and our cultural uh, S legacy, for example, this was initiated in the non-fiction side, and this year it coincides that at the end of the day we're going to tell uh, stories of two, Lola and Rafael, two real stories, which is the story of our country, history of our country, because Rafael at the end of the day, from the post-war uh, to the, is all the way to millennia. He's not Messi. He's De Stefano Pelé, Cruyff, Maradona, and Messi at the same time. And many decades, there's been a lot. Being number one, by the way, so therefore that's why I'm using those examples. And at, with RL, RLM and Universal to wager in favor of the young people like Alberto and Charlie, the talent of our audiovisual uh, industry has been a true privilege and a, a, a privilege uh, to be in Movie Star Plus of the history of Spain and our cultural values and to wager in favor of music with our own production. And we're going to celebrate our concert number 100 in what we call movie star sessions. A question for Rafael. I don't think that there's anyone in Spain who doesn't know who you are as a figure, but yesterday, watching the second uh, episode that was shown to the press, perhaps I wasn't aware of the repercussion internationally that you had in the, at that time with those trips to you, the United States, to Latin America. Do you believe, Rafael, that what you've done is, well, is known or that many people only see a figure that's always been there, but I'm not too sure 
whether you feel that, that is say that people truly don't know everything that you've done. I think they do. Well, uh, knowing absolutely everything, I don't even know <laughs> everything because there's many, many things and there's many, many years one after another. It's a lot of time. But I, I consider myself, I consider that the audience and knows me and they love me, they accept me, and they have done this for many years. They fill in, they fill up the, the theatres that, and they buy my records. Five records, ten records, okay, twenty records, and you go, well, that's incredible. But when you start to go over sixty or seventy records, how far can we go? How many? Well, as as far as whatever you, the audience, wants to, as long as you, the audience, wants to, and I'll be here. And undoubtedly, you will get to know me even more as time goes by. Hi, Rafael. From Cinemanet, um, I would like to ask you, you've talked about your future as a person and as an artist, but what do you think about the future of music? Because I'm 18 and I know who you are, I know some of your songs, and you've been 40 years on, on stage. What will happen when I'm 30 or 20 years' time? What type of music, if we'll continue to listen to what you sing, or well, how do you think, which way is music going in that respect? Well, I think from that, we'll conti that you'll continue to listen to the best from all genres. We'll have to decide what's good and what's bad. It's early. I believe it's early to be able to make an opinion of what's listened to nowadays because you've had very little time to listen. But in a five years or ten years' time, society will say, what songs that have been sung now that, that people like and those, and those that go by the by because people didn't like them. But in my period, when I already started to sing, well, not everything was a hit and not everything became history neither mine nor of any other singers, but there, are, there is a great amount of songs that I've m sung. And that's what I desire, that you people, young people today that I like, I like 18-year-old uh, people, imagine all the duets that I've sung with young um, up-and-coming singers, because I love it. I like to be with the young people always. We'll see what's left and what is, what remains and what doesn't. But whatever remains, I'm going to try to be there also as well. To sing it with you or on my own, as I've done up until now. Me again. Okay, I would like you to talk about the title of the series. Rafaelismo. What is Rafaelismo? Because the ismo, ism, it's a tender of innovation in the arts, which opposes, which goes contrary to what already existed beforehand. That's the meaning. And then, then uh, for Rafael, he can answer me. The Rafaelismo, the ism, ismo part of. It. Say it again because I didn't understand what you said. Now I'm reading it. Ismo, ism, is, is, that's what it means, tend or innovation, mainly in the arts, which opposes itself to what was already existing beforehand. That's what it means. And then talk about the fest Eurovision Film Festival. The, the Eurovision Festival, because in the documentary you say, I lost, but I won. Sometimes you've got to lose to win, or what happens there? Sometimes you've got to learn to lose to win. Undoubtedly, yes, you do. I agree with you there. But I don't lose with this at all. I win. At least I win towards myself, my courage, and my way, the way I cope with life and face life and with my work, as I've always done so since I was four years old when I started to sing. The truth is, the ism side of things 
I see it in much simpler. There's the things that have been done in my way. That's how I understand it. Everything I do in my way for me is an ism or ismo in Spanish. I don't imitate anyone. I can presume that I don't, no one, there are a lot of people that try to imitate me, but I don't imitate anyone from the beginnings. And that's what ismo is about, or the ism side of the title, yes. And if you'll allow me, the ism is also avant-garde, and Rafael has always been at the, fr in the front line of the avant-gardes, and he's going to continue to be so. Front row, please. A, qu a very simple question now that we're listening to you. How do you do it to maintain that passion every day? Because you feel you convey energy, passion. How do you maintain that passion? Is there any recipe that you could tell us? I'm sure there must be, and you don't want to tell us. I swear by all of the gods in the sky that I don't know where that passion comes from. That's the way I am. And that's it, period. There's no other thing I can say. And I'm a person who's very happy because I work in what I like and I'm surrounded by the people who I like. I talk about what I like. I don't talk about other things. I talk about this. This is what I talk about. And I think if you... That, if you'll allow me, is the only and great secret that I have, the passion that I put into things, is genuine. Me again, for Rafael over here. At the end of the second episode, we see that in 1978, I think, or the end of the 70s, uh, singer-songwriters would came into the Vogue, and the documentary says that the ballad singers like like you underwent a crisis period, a period of crisis. Um, I would like to ask Rafael: At any time, do you thought you were out of the out of fashion, or uh, or your career was endangered in any way? Never, never. Oh, what I did in the 1980s, first of all. My most significant record, I made it in that period, which is Que se ve nadie en carne viva. These songs were on the record. On that record, I continued, Yo sigo siendo aquel. The, these are songs. So I reaffirmed my place in the 1980s, but I needed more, a greater field. And the field was on the other side of the Atlantic. And I went to the other side of the Atlantic, which also belonged me because of it was my right, because I worked for this. So therefore, I was living in Miami, in New York, in Mexico, living and working, by the way, not just out for a walk with my family behind me, because I took everyone with me. My children studied in all of those different countries. And they had that culture in them, thanks to of addressing, do, facing my life in the next 10 years, we're, I'm going to do it abroad. And they helped me very much. And the audience didn't forget me at all. All the contrary. I was remembered. And when I came back, it was, it was incredible again. It was quite incredible. Hi, Rafael. We would love for you for someone to take the gauntlet and to see you again uh, in a film in the future. That would be marvelous. And I would like to ask you, it's painful, but it's true that if any director believed in the artist to you was Mario Comus, who left us yesterday. He was the first one. And I would like you to talk about what Mario Camus has meant for you, that takeoff with him and the, the trust and the dissemination of the other and Rafael. Mario it was marvelous. I had a tough day yesterday because yesterday I found out my wife sent a WhatsApp to him for condolence to con 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 condolences. His wife, who had lied two years ago, and we hadn't found out about it, so it was very tough for me. Mario brought me into the world of cinema. He 
he asked for an audition for me, and I had the honor of having Jose Borralo, one of the best actors that Spain has seen, and they took me to the studio. They did another audition with one of my songs, which is called Tu Conciencia, Your Conscience, by Manuel Ale Alejandro, naturally. And that's where the passion of a marvelous director, as Mario Camus was, and that friendship which has lasted all of the years that his life lasted, and my, conti my life continues. Uh, my wife reminded me when I was in Granada, when, when she was doing Si Las Piedras Hablaran for Spanish TV, Mario was directing her, and it was the 5th of May, and he said, Natalia, as you're going out with, with Rafael, it's her, his birthday today, and I was in Russia at that time. Shall we congratulate him? So I want to say with this is that Mario was in our lives quite a lot. And he continues to be so because this is something that doesn't finish there. In fact, my curiosity is to ask the creators of this series whether, because as we've only seen one episode, whether there is, in cinema, Rafael, for example, he's a great uh, film star like Mario Camus, Cuando tú no estás, digan lo que digan, etc. I'd like to know whether you're going to portray this side in the series. Yes, the truth is we continue to make the series. What we're presenting is only episode two, but the production started in February this year, and we're still not in the process of closing a few things in other episodes. In, chapter, in, in episode four is when we talk about the film career of Rafael, and we give an overview of all of the films and what it meant vis-a-vis -vis the international expansion of his, of his phenomenon in Russia. He entered into Russia due to, through a film. We're going to finish, but if anyone wants to ask any further questions, yes. Bea? Hi again. The press occupies a very important part in this episode, but I imagine all the episodes, why? Well, well, I've got the feeling that at certain times it's a bit tough. There was almost, he was always harassed, and his relationship with Natalia, his wife, and whether it was true or not, that he was win making it good, uh, big abroad. What was your relationship with the press at that time? I know it's very good now, but at that time, perhaps, I'm not too sure. I've, it's always been very good, the press or the media. Uh, there, was only a, 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 uh, there was only one time when you went right over the top, which is when you went of trying to transplant me. We were uh, under siege, really. I couldn't even leave the house to see a film when I had the transplant, so therefore, uh, the whole family was under siege by the media. But apart from that bothersome moment, um, the press and the media has always treated me, treated me very well, and it's always been on my side, always. There's a rumor there, the press and the media was in charge of there's a rumor and the media put the pla put, put things into place i have no, i've got a lot of friends in media in the me in in the in the in media and from all different generations imagine and i'm very thankful to them I'm very thankful okay yes one final question danila crame from el universo de cuadro Ecuador de la Jornada de Mexico. We love Rafael because so much art and songs and memories. Are you going to come back to Latin America in the future? Are you thinking about this? To go back to Latin America? Well, I, 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 a full tour is what I... I owed because I was in Latin America when the pandemic started. And apart from coming back or straight away, they made me come back straight away when the pandemic occurred. 
I've got to do a full tour, which is a full year, in America. So therefore, when I can, I get the chance. And I, the health, de the health department allows me to go. I've got to jump on a plane and do a one-year tour in America. And at the same time, uh, taking care of everyone in Spain. Yes, but I, if if uh, you know if if I'm luckily enough, looks like perhaps next year when things will get better, the situation gets better. I and I'll hopefully to go into to that continent that I love so much and that and that has, has always been very good to me. Okay. This has nothing to do with it, but. One of the most, one of the best moments that I've lived on stage was in the National Auditorium. You know, we Spaniards are not very well contemplated, for example, in Mexico. We're not, we're not seen too well. They call us cachupines, it's a nickname, and I know this, but in Mexico, Mexico adores me, and you're a witness of this, and not a long, one of the last times I was in Mexico, I spent, I had one of those nights which was a special night. The concert came out where the people, it was a very special concert and I cried because it was what happened, what was happening to me, I was almost crying. And I got up to the microphone and in front of 20,000 people that can fit into the National Auditorium, I said, and I'm a Kachupin, by the way, and you guys are applauding me so much. Okay, well, unfortunately, we have to stop here, but I, I ask you, because the press is, the media has always helped them, let's give them a round, big round of applause to him and to everyone else involved in the documentary series.